that's what came at. Hi, everyone. Megan with the New York State Brewers Association. Really appreciate you jumping on this webinar about renewable energy, specifically about solar energy. Our presenters today um, are Green Spark, and they are based in Rochester. So, you know, nice local New York based company here to talk about um, the basics of solar. Uh, many of you probably don't know, but I actually used to work in the solar industry. So, um, when sustainability and craft beer kind of come together, uh, it's like a sweet spot for me personally. So, I'm really interested in the presentation, but hopefully, Green Spark will um, educate us a little bit about the basics of solar energy, how it can benefit your brewery, how to take advantage of any financial resources available to transition to solar energy. Um, and it might be a really great avenue for many New York State breweries to head down to uh, potentially save money, but also be uh, more responsible from an environmental perspective. So we're happy to have Stephanie and Matt on the call today. Uh, so I will turn it over to you, Matt, to introduce you and, and your company. And uh, thanks again to all the breweries in New York who are participating in this um, in this valuable webinar discussion. Thanks, Megan. And yeah, thanks to everybody for joining. And I know everybody's super busy. So uh, appreciate you taking the time to, to sit down and uh, kind of talk through this. So uh, similar, somewhat similar to Megan, although I have never worked in the beer industry, I love beer. Uh, solar and beer are two of my favorite things. So, um, you know, the genesis of this was a, a conversation that we had with Will Cleveland, uh, who wrote an article uh, about solar and beer. We sort of collaborated with him on a few months ago, and that sort of led in into this conversation. So excited to talk through this and and kind of go through, you know, where things are today, some of the challenges that that have existed in, uh, in, in solar for breweries. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we can get started. If I can, there we go. Uh, so uh, I'm Matt Vanderbrook. Uh, I'm the director of commercial origination at Green Spark Solar. Um, fancy title for sales and development. Um, and I've worked at Green Spark for 16 years. Uh, Green Spark is a 21 year old uh, company. Started, uh, you know, started by some college friends in in a garage. That that type of deal. Uh, and you know, we originally were a wind energy company. Shifted to solar about 2011. Uh, and that has been our our main focus as a company. Um, and I'll just kind of the commercial. There, there's several segments to our company. We have a whole residential division that's um, focused on installing residential solar in and around the Greater Rochester area. Uh, and then we have our commercial division, which is uh, the team that I'm involved in, uh, and that has a few different aspects of it. Um, we build large scale solar farms around New York State. Uh, we do some of our own development. And then more specifically to, I think our conversation today is our is what we call our CNI or commercial and industrial division. And so that solar that we're building for a business or a school or a facility that's on the roof or on their property that's that's directly benefiting them. And that's the type of structure that um, we'll, we'll discuss today. And that's really been an area of growth for us. I think for, the, for a long time, um, it kind of went and fits and starts have a project here or there, but we're really seeing some momentum around building these types of projects, which I'll kind of get into some of our details. Um, and this slide uh, just mentions that we're a certified B corporation, so we're a benefit corporation. So uh, for those that don't know, uh, B Labs is sort of an independent uh, certification that you that companies can get uh, based on certain metrics around uh, sustainability and how you treat your employees and what you do for your community. So we talk about it as a triple bottom line. So just something very important to our company. We've been a B Corp for five or six years now and, and take it very seriously. So, um, and then, uh, you know, this will be the last slide about Green Spark. Uh, we're consistently voted as one of the top workplaces in Rochester. Uh, we're consistently sort of in in the top tier of fastest growing companies in Rochester, uh, and we're you know we're up to 115 employees these days, split between our residential and commercial division. So it's a it's an exciting time in our in our business. Um, so you know this is kind of where we get into you know the economics of solar, um, and if people have questions just about you know, solar in general and, and how it works, we can certainly get into that. I think the structure and the economics of solar is sort of the big, kind of the big question that, that people want to learn, learn about and why, you know, why it can work here, why it might not work here. 
Uh, and I think one of the biggest reasons that that solar is viable in New York from an economic standpoint is is the support from the state is from NYSERDA. So NYSERDA has uh, the state has set some very ambitious goals around uh, electricity consumption, where we're getting our electricity from, a push for electric vehicles, zero emissions and new building construction. So there's just a lot of efforts at the state level to um, advocate for solar as well as other um, mechanisms to deal with climate change. Uh, for solar specifically, um, NYSERDA is the funding arm that provides incentives to projects. So typically an incentive for a NYSERDA project would cover about 25% of the overall system cost. So that's sort of been, you know, one of the big drivers and, and why we've been so, why we've been successful, right? We we only, currently we only build projects in New York because there's a lot of, there's enough work in New York to do that. Um, so, it, you know, again, New York de deserves a lot of credit for, you know, how fast the industry has grown here and, and the success here. So. Um, so, uh, why breweries are switching to solar and, and I'll, and I'll preface this by saying a couple of things. First off, we don't have any solar projects installed for breweries. Uh, I hope that changes soon and maybe with someone on this call, but, uh, that, that would be great. So it's something that, you know, to be real, to be honest, uh, it, it's, it's been something that made a lot of sense from our, from our standpoint. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of similarities in the type of customer and sort of what people want to see and, and, you know, seeing solar energy on a facility can, can make, um, can kind of look appealing to, to people. Um, and so I think one of the issues that we've had with, with solar on, on breweries, especially on craft breweries is just, you know, the expense and the benefit of the project comes through a tax credit. And so to be able to utilize the tax credit, you've, you've needed to, you know, be profitable. You need to make a significant a lot of a significant amount of money to cover those costs. And just with you know how new a lot of the breweries are in the industry, just kind of getting started up and not sort of having that tax liability, that's kind of been a, an, an issue to get through because that's one of the main the other main mechanisms that these projects are supported is through the tax credits. Um, I think what's changed uh, over time is really based on some policy changes as well as electricity cost changes. Um, so in uh, August of last year, the Inflation Reduction Act passed and that um, A, extended the tax credit, um, the 30% the tax credit for 10 years, uh, added some additional tax credits as well. Uh, and then it also provided additional funding for um, the, the REAP program through the USDA. So that's the Rural Energy for America program. So that, that funding has always existed, but it's been very kind of scattershot. It will exist and then it'll go away. And they sort of provided a pretty, a pretty decent runway for obtaining those grants. So we started our first few projects under, that, under the REAP program uh, over the summer, and they've since received their funding. Um, and so this is a sort of a new way that, um, you know, businesses and uh, in New York can benefit and, and get and, and go get additional support for their project. Um, the one caveat with, with the REAP program is you have to be a rural business, uh, but the, the map of what constitutes a rural business is pretty broad. Um, so like, you know, Canandaigua, as an example, is a place that would qualify for a REAP grant. Um, suburbs of, of Rochester or Syracuse or Buffalo, you know, they're probably on the line. Some of them probably don't because they're in a more sort of urban built up area. So there are some maps. Um, we, we certainly can help in that regard for, for people to look, or you can look up yourselves to see if you would, you would qualify in that. Um, so, and I, I guess the other thing to point out around these benefits that we have listed um, are electricity rate increases, right? So el electricity prices spiked uh, in 2021. Um, or in 2022, they kind of leveled off a little bit last year. And then we just saw, you know, rg &E just got, rg &E NYSEG just got their uh, rate increases uh, uh, approved about, um, I think it's about a 20% over three year increase. So we're going to see electricity rates continue to, to rise, maybe not, you know, signif as significantly as it was a couple of years ago, but we're still going to see those increases happen. And solar is really one of the few ways that you can actually offset um or, or hedge against those rise in electricity in crisis because you're controlling the electricity that you're using, you're getting credits from it, from the grid. Um, and the way it works in New York is you can, you can essentially net what's called net metering. Uh, so you can export 
even if you're not using the solar at the time, you can export that electricity and you get sort of a, an equal value credit back that you can then apply to your bill in different times. So like in the summertime, when you're using, you may use most of your electricity and your air conditioning, but you're also the sun's out and you're producing the most, you can bank those credits and then use them in the wintertime when, you know, the sun's been gone for three months. Um, so, um, those are just some of the ways uh, to do that. And like I said, I, I think there's a, there's a benefit, there's an element to solar of, of, you know, it's, it's interesting or it's desirable from a customer standpoint to see, you know, to see businesses taking, taking the step to go solar. So, um, there's a picture of Maine beer company. That's an example. I know, um, there's a, I think Ithaca brewing has, um, has some solar. There's some, um, alchemist and, uh, Lawson's in Vermont have solar. So there, there's certainly a lot of, uh, well-established breweries that that have gone the path of, of solar at their at their facility. Um, so I mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, right? That has just had a huge impact. The other the other piece I'll note on the IRA um, is that it created some additional tax credits that are available in certain locations. Um, so there's a there's a low low income adder for some locations, which is more of a competitive process that we the rules just kind of came out. We're still trying to understand it. And then there's a, another tax credit around sort of green communities. Um, and again, there's a map of this that shows locations where usually where there's a coal plant closure or some other um, fossil fuel employment where you can get an additional tax credit. So for an example, like Seneca County is uh, in the Finger Lakes is one of those areas. We've, you know, we, we have a project down there and, and, and know that that qualifies. So there's there's a lot of different potential tax credits that that people can look into for for their projects. Um, and so here's sort of wrapping it all together, right? Combining the incentives, right? There's a thirty percent federal tax credit. Um, tax liability is key to to being able to use that. Um, there's accelerated depreciation. Uh, which basically just provides some uh, benefit to, to buy down the costs of, of those projects and include that in the economics. And then the NYSERDA funding, which is currently uh, 25 cents a watt uh, up to 70, 750 kilowatts, which, as I mentioned, covers somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of, of what the total project cost uh cost would be. There's incentives above 750 kilowatts. It's, those are pretty large systems, but um, a slightly different program that, that goes into that. Um, so how do we, how do we finance these projects? So, um, typically a project of this scale would be owned by, you know, the end user that that's typically how we approach them. Sometimes we have some third party options, but they're a little more difficult to kind of meet the requirements to make it work. So generally speaking, we, we find some sort of financing solution. Um, we have, um, we have a financing product, um, through a company called Orca, um, and so they'll, they can provide 0% down financing, uh, rates as low as 6.9%. That's high, but that's sort of where rates are. And then um, you, you can stretch that out from the term of five years to 20 years. So that's one way that, that we finance projects in this scale. Uh, a lot of times our customers will just kind of work with, um, you know, work with their bank or who are, their lender to, to structure a project. Maybe it's someone they're more familiar with. Um, and a lot of the banks these days, they're they're pretty familiar with with solar and employing it on their building. So it's usually not that hard of a, a of a process to get through with them to uh, I guess understand how how we're structuring how we're structuring the project. Um, and as I mentioned uh, about REAP, just to kind of get into a little more details, um, it's you know biz eligibility businesses with at least fifty percent of their gross income from ag production or small businesses in eligible rural areas as I mentioned so like I mentioned it's a pretty widespread area that that qualify for these um, the re program grants are capped at forty percent the minimum is twenty five hundred the minute the max grant is a million dollars um, it's it used to be a com more competitive process it still is but there's a lot more flexibility in the way they calculate. Um, the, the return requirements are a little more favorable to solar than, than they used to be. And then REAP also has uh, some guaranteed loans to take advantage of. So how we handle the REAP program is we have a, a different entity uh, that we work with that sort of handles all the REAP application documentation. They're just sort of, that's how they're built to do. And then, um, you know, once a, once a grant is approved, then it, you know, kicks over to us to initiate all the other, you know, design tasks and ultimately construction tasks for the project. Um, and so just, uh, we, we just wanted to give just some examples of the projects that we've done. Um, you know, these are more kind of agricultural, but the similar type of CNI project. So this is Cherry Lawn Fruit Farms. So this is an apple storage facility. 
project we did five or six years ago at this point, but was um, did receive a REAP grant for their project. Uh, so it's about 158 kilowatt, um, covers 100% of their electric load uh, and saving them about $25,000 uh, annually. They're actually, um, we're actually building an expansion on, on the rest of that barn uh, that should be happening uh, later this year as well. So um, kind of the the, t the type of project size that, you know, I think a lot of times we see in this, uh, in sort of the, the smaller business uh, brewery size range that, that we would expect just based on consumption. Uh, Long Acre. So this is a this is a ground mount system. Uh, Long Acre Farms. Uh, for those who haven't been, it's a great place to take your kids. Uh, and they have a big corn maze. Um, and it's a winery uh, as well. Um, so this system was built across the street from their main facility. Uh, there was not really a ton of room on their roofs to put anything substantial for what their electricity needs, but they have land. So we were able to build the ground mount system. And so that did hundred percent of their usage at the time. Uh, and, um, and now we're same deal. We're, we're building another system for them on a roof mount to sort of deal with some of the additional uh, electricity requirements that they have there. Um, and ultimately over the lifetime of the system, uh, which I should have mentioned, typically a lifetime of a solar array is, is 25 years. That's the warranted life, uh, warranted production life of the modules. So that's sort of what we assume is the, the general lifetime, although they can they can obviously go beyond 25 years after that. So in the 25 years um, that this project will operate for Long Acre, they'll see about $300,000 in, in savings over, over that lifetime. Uh, another winery, uh, Young Summer uh, in, in Wayne County, much smaller system, but um, you know, providing still providing some significant savings to them. Uh, and then just to give an example of just some of the larger scale stuff, um, this is a project we did for RIT uh, in 2018, basically about a 10 acre array um, out behind um, on their property, but sort of out behind the campus, um, funded through NYSERDA, New York Sun program, um, and owned by a third party. I, I, I mentioned the, the third party, so they don't actually own the system. Someone else bought it and uses the tax credit. So um, like I mentioned, that's something that is we do uh, on occasion, but there's very specific requirements to be able to, to kind of take that third party route. And usually it's a larger scale system is, is required to get to that point. Um, yep. Yeah, and so I, I referenced the, the article. So uh, Cleveland Prost, which is uh, Will Cleveland's newsletter uh, in August, we he did a little write up about, uh, about solar uh, for breweries and just gave some more examples and, and discussed, you know, some of the same, you know, maybe some of the same issues, but the same opportunities, opportunities that exist. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, sh the spiel. Um, we have plenty of time to answer questions. I'd happy to like, learn about other beers that people have or talk about beer in general, because that's what I do in my spare time anyways. So, but, uh, but yeah, love to take any questions on the chat. That's how we're doing that. Right. Am I allowed to ask a question without using chat? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a minimum size brewery that would be applicable for solar energy like is there a certain um it's uh development you know or size brewery that uh, would really benefit that would be like the sweet spot or is there a minimum of like well once you get to this size brewery you really start considering solar or yeah. you know, are breweries too small for solar that kind of thing it's a great question and i think it, it, it is really a it is kind of a case by case right like i think one of the things that anytime someone reaches out to us and says they want to do solar right like we have to do an analysis of their consumption and their building, right? So it, it's, you know, I know I, I know in breweries that we've talked to in the past, you know, one of the struggles has been, you know, we don't have a ton of roof space for this, or we don't have a lot of area for this. So maybe, you know, maybe a brewery needs 100,000 kilowatt hours of, of year, a year of electricity, but they only, but we can only build a system that offsets, you know, 20% of that. Um, still can work right the the project economics can still work it's just you know it probably doesn't look quite as good and it's also not offsetting as much as as, as you would like um, so those are really the things that we would want to get into on a case by case i wouldn't say that any size couldn't do it um if i had to say there's a sweet spot for for just 
this size solar in general, like it's usually in like the hundred kilowatt range, which is, you're probably getting into a, you know, a larger, you know, a larger size brewery. I, I honestly don't know what the general consumption is. I assume it's pretty significant, but um, you know, I, I, something we would want to, someone would want to dig into for sure. But once you get into sort of that hundred kilowatt scale, you start to just kind of see the economics improve. Generally speaking, um, you know, people ask like, well, what's the, what's the payback period I could expect on a project? And usually it's like in the 10 to 12 year range, that's kind of where it is. Uh, a lot of that does depend on, you know, what the cost of electricity is and all that, but that's sort of the, the general payback period uh, for one of these projects. Thanks. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Uh, can solar be used to power EV charging stations? Great question, yes. I certainly can. I mean, usually when, so we do install EV uh, charging equipment. Usually it's part of like a solar project, like we'll build solar and then we'll in incorporate EV as well. So that would just be, you know, the EV charging station would be tied in directly to, um, directly to your facilities infrastructure, uh, just as the solar would be. So, you know, essentially we're, we're doing the same thing. There are, you know, there are certainly things where that you can have solar panels that are just dedicated to the car, uh, to the charging station, but it's a little, you know, when the sun's not out, you won't, you want to still be able to charge your car. So usually it's all part of one, uh, part of the infrastructure of, of the building itself. Um, and then, uh, Chris question about, uh, we use farm credit East for various expansion projects. Yeah. I mean, that's great. I mean, I know farm credit East, a, they are very familiar with the REAP program. Um, I'm, I'm sure they do. A, I mean, I know they do a lot of different, uh, financing incorporating REAP. So they're, they're a great opportunity as well. And like I said, we don't have a preference, right? We just have, we have a vehicle to provide financing if people want it, but in general, you know, it, it's, it's whatever you're comfortable with. And if you have a good relationship with, with your bank, like that's, that's great too. Um, and, you know, to your question about grant writers, like same deal, right? Like we have no preference. Um, we work with someone who has a lot of experience with it, but Farm Credit East, you know, they're going to know a lot about how to do this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, we make sure that we have that, the resource available, but you know, if you have other resources of an existing relationships, you know, those are certainly be best to lean on. Um, yeah. So if someone was just asking about um, the REAP grant um, as an option. So like, and they were working with us previously, um, you know, I think the question on the REAP grant only certain entities are eligible, right? As I mentioned, so it's it could have been an issue with the location of the of the brewery, but um, you know the, the USDA REAP maps are are publicly available, and and if you know if someone has a question and want to know if they're eligible, they they can call us and we can we can pull up the map and and explain it, uh, explain how that that works. But um, but yeah, I mean, really anybody that's it's can qualify in those as long as they're in those areas for that program. So we can and we can kind of get more into the details of of how that. Is structured and how that all all works. Um, and then uh, the the other question from George of how much success have you had in getting grants? Um, so it's funny the USDA program was a lot more difficult to get funding from previously before the IRA. It was uh, their methodology was different. So like we were competing against uh, solar was up against like other efficiency uh, serve. Uh, efficiency projects at farms like um uh, grain drying and so like if you have a more efficient efficient grain dryer or you install leds or something like that like the payback the investment in payback on those is very small like it's like two year paybacks on on those types of items and so we were sort of up against that um or our solar projects were up against those and so we would often not win because our payback period is longer but the projects you know solar is a long-term investment it's a you know project's that's going to last 25 plus years. And so the, the, the pay, the return, it's not really an apples to apples. So it was always a difficult argument to make, but since they changed the rules and they rolled out the program, which just happened this summer. So we've already secured reap awards for uh, two or three projects that, that we'll build, uh, that we'll start construction on, on next year. Um, so, oh yeah. Typical ROI. Thanks, Mary. Great question. Uh, 
Typical ROI on these projects. Uh, I mean, again, it, it does depend on the on the size of the system that we're but that we're looking at. But you know, we're seeing you know generally in in excess of of ten to twelve percent on the return investment for for these projects. Um, so it's a you know it's a good investment. Like I said, it's a long term investment. To you just have to consider that. But um, you know, it'll it'll be it'll be generating electricity for for a long period of time. Um, and so if any other, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to shoot them on there. Feel free to reach out to us, um, with questions. Oh, here they're coming in. Um, how does solar benefit businesses as utility rates increase? So solar is the way to, you know, basically once you've installed solar, that's, you're getting that electricity for free, like you've paid for it. You've sort of paid for it ahead of time. And so every kilowatt hour that being produced by your system is just offsetting, you know, the cost of electricity. So in 20 years, when electricity rates are, who knows what they're going to be, right? Right now they're in the nine cent range. By that point, they could be, they could be double. They could even be more than that, but you're still sort of, so you're getting even more value from your solar uh, later on, just because of where electricity rate increases are going. Um, Another question, do you have recommendations on how breweries can leverage their investment through commun consumer communications? This is a great question for our marketing team, but I will I will do my best to answer this. Um, it's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, we when we've done projects with our customers, like a Long Acre, for example, right? They incorporate that into their overall marketing message of like, hey, we're, you know, we're powered by solar, we're saving this much money from solar, the green aspect of the project. We always throw out um, this example, which is probably dated at this point, but I'm going to use it anyways. So we built a wind turbine, a large wind turbine for uh, Jiminy Peak Ski Resort in Massachusetts in like 2010. Um, and they did a marketing study after the system was installed and they asked, you know, sort of a representative group of people that were there, why they were there and about, you know, 30 to 40% of the people that were there were there because of the wind turbine, right? That, that's, that was, um, that spoke to people about the type of, you know, the type of group that that ski resort was that they were actually taking, you know, um, the effects of climate change seriously, and also, you know, making a smart economic investment from their standpoint. So, you know, and that's certainly stuff, you know, we do as in our marketing team, right? We're constantly putting out messages of, you know, the benefits that solar can provide to a business. And it's certainly something that we would, you know, help any brewery um, talk about, um, talk about doing. Um, and, and, you know, when I've seen other, the other breweries that, that have, have installed solar, you know, the ones in Vermont, I mentioned, right. Those are things that are, um, often uh, mentioned in their social media and all that. So it certainly, it certainly has a, has an impact. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think one of the, um, you know, what based on like that Jiminy Peak example and really anything is, is companies that are, are taking these steps. It, it's not, you know, it's a great marketing message. It's a great message to your customers. But at the end of the day, it's a smart business decision, right? Like, as I mentioned at the top, there's not a lot of things you can do to hedge against where electricity prices will end up going, right? Electricity prices have have are always going to be going up. They might not, um, they might level off at certain times, but ultimately they're going to be going up uh, in an upward trajectory. And solar is one of those ways that you can deal with that. And it, you know, today when rates are nine cents a kilowatt hour. Um, you know, the economics will, they'll, they'll look good, but it's really when electricity prices are, are dramatically higher than, than they are today, when you're really going to start, you know, seeing those, seeing those benefits. Um, so, uh, if there's no more questions, there's more great. And you can always reach out to GreenSpark, uh, and we'll put you in touch with the right people here. Uh, just generally how our system works, um, you know, when we, if someone is expresses an interest in solar, uh, you know, we get, you know, the first bits of information we get are, you know, your location, you know, what's your building look like and how much energy you use. So we'll actually, we'll, we'll request an electricity bill to see what your consumption is. 
to try to match that as close as we can. We can't overproduce a system. There's, you know, there's some, you know, basically you lose value if you produce more than you need over the course of a year. So we try to size it as close to, to 100% as possible. But again, depends on, on the roof and, and all that. So that's really the first thing we do. And then we'll run an economic analysis and say, hey, this is this is what the benefits would look like and give you the options of financing and lease. Um, as I mentioned, we have yet to install uh, a system on a brewery. So we would be excited to uh, do that with someone soon. And, you know, uh, anyone, I mean, going solar with anyone's great. If you go with us, we'll definitely, uh, we'll come party and hang out and, and drink all your beer. So, uh, we would love to do that. Um, plan. Oh, question from Chris planning phases of an expansion. Um, so that's certainly something like we, we do this quite often, right? Where it's a new build, uh, you have some preliminary information. Uh, we can sort of work with you on that, what that would look like, right? Like what's the sizing of what, you know, how much energy do you anticipate using in the future? Can we, you know, build a somewhat larger system to deal with that? You know, is this new building uh, solar ready? Can we, are there things that we can do from a design st standpoint to make it solar ready? Um, and we have some, you know, our, our design team can help sort of a, go through that process and sort of provide that that input um, for, for anyone that's looking to to have an expansion. Um, great. Uh, well, like I said, um, any questions or comments, you can reach out to GreenSpark directly. Uh, my email's on here. You can call us. Um, and there's a lot of smart folks here that, that can help, uh, walk you through this process. If that's something that, that you're interested in doing. Um, and, uh, I got a great new list of breweries that I'm going to check out based on the webinar. So it'll take a while to get to all of them, but I, I, I will do it at some point. Um, but, uh, yeah, really, uh, really appreciate everyone's time. Oh, I got one more question coming in. Uh, can you sell excess back to the utility company? Um, to, to a point. Um, so as I mentioned, we have net metering in New York, which means you can export electricity and get a credit back. It's usually, it's like a, it's, it's essentially a, like a one-to-one -one credit. There's different billing structures you can do to di different ways, but, more more often than not, you, you can build a bank of credits that you can then use at different times of the year, right? In the wintertime, we're not going to be producing very much uh, solar generation. So you can use the bank credits you banked in the summertime to offset in the winter. Um, but there comes a point where, you know, if you use 100,000 kilowatt hours a year at your facility, but you make a hundred and you, but you generate 150,000 and export that the grid, you're not getting much benefit from that additional 50,000. They're going to value, essentially, you're just going to get a bank of credits that you can't use is what's going to happen, or they'll value it at avoided cost, which is what they've done historically. Um, and that's usually like wholesale rate for electricity, which is like two or three cents. So it doesn't really make any sense to make anything bigger than than you would actually need there are you know you can um you can remote credit uh in new york where you can sell or you can send access to different customers or different meters uh it could be your maybe you're a place that has more than one meter uh maybe you have um you know other partners that you work with you could send credits to there so there, there's some different there's some interesting ways that you could deal with excess generation if that's something that maybe you have a really great roof and it's really big, but maybe you don't need it all. Like there's some different ways you could you could take advantage of and, and use that excess electricity. Um, yeah, so I think we covered everything. Um, and uh, yeah, like appreciate everyone's time and, and taking time out of your busy schedule to, to join us here and, and feel free to reach out. And, and, and Megan, thanks for uh, thanks for having us on here to, to set this up. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Matt, for all the information. You take care. We'll see you at a brewery soon. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, everybody.